Salts and acids break down a lot quicker than sugars. Bitter components, the polyphenols, they come in later. Channeling, I would say, is the number one thief of extraction. Multiple times behind the cart and behind the bar, we're like trying to over extract our coffee and we literally can't. Hello and welcome to the Valor Coffee Podcast. You are about to embark on a journey of over extraction. That's right, over extraction and how you can go about fixing that problem in your brewing, whether it's at home or in your cafe. We talk about all things related channeling astringency, polyphenols, uneven extractions. We really dive in here and talk about our experience with over extraction. Honestly, how we have struggled to even over extract our coffee and why that might be. And we even ran some tests, got some data using our refractometer and we will reveal those results to you. This is gonna be a short little series. Our next episode will be about under extraction and how you can fix that. So if this is the future, that episode might be out. So go ahead and check that before or after this one, whatever you need in your or coffee extracting journey. If we got any new listeners, we do this every week. We talk about coffee. We talk about the coffee industry business. We have guests on the show from other coffee companies, and we really love doing this. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel, like this video, rate us on your podcast platform of choice. We like Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and maybe go through our catalog, see if there's any other things that interest you. And don't forget to share our reels on your Instagram stories. At Valor Coffee Pod is our Instagram. We do a Q&A a segment every week. So if you want to have your question answered live on air, go ahead and send us a question to this email right here, info at valor.coffee, and we will answer your question. Unless it's something silly, we might not answer a silly one, or we might, who knows. We have a course platform coming in the near future that you can sign up for updates on in the bio or description of this video slash podcast. Put your email there. We will email you news about it. We're going to even put out some surveys to see what you you would like to see from it because we're doing it for you guys. Things we've already got lined up include some spreadsheets about catering quotes for you cart starters out there. We've got some PDFs about every single item you could ever need behind your coffee bar. We're going to have videos about bookkeeping for coffee shops, Instagram for coffee shops. It's going to go deep and it's going to be all tailored specifically for the coffee community and business leaders out there. Even some training videos that you can hand out to your staff to help you in that process. We tasted an awesome coffee from One Line Coffee out of Ohio. Thank you for sending this coffee our way. Spoiler alert, it was fantastic. If you would like to have your coffee featured on the podcast, you can send that our way. Shoot us an Instagram message or an email. Email is info at valor.coffee. Instagram is at valorcoffeepod. We'll send you our address. You can send it to us. We will give you an unbiased and genuine review. So be aware of that. Last thing, I am wearing new merch. We dropped hoodies, a long sleeve tee, a pocket tee, mugs, some tumblers. If you want to check those out, honestly, that helps the program if you wear our stuff and rep Valor. So that link is down in the bio, or you can just go to valor.coffee and shop through our stuff. All right, without further ado, here is our conversation about over extraction. It's coffee time, boys. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Cheers. 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 We're drinking a coffee from One Line Coffee out of Heath, Heath, New York. No, Ohio. <laughs> Heath, Ohio. I don't know why. I Heath, said New Ohio. York. And we will discuss this coffee in its full at the end of the episode. Stay tuned. But we're gonna be sipping on it for now. And oh, that cap! Spoiler alert! It's tasting pretty good. Yeah. Oh. Cold <laughs> fermentation, pink per bourbon. Mm-hmm. Woof. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Boys, let's dive right into some questions. We got some oh, pretty yes. solid questions this week. And one is a question that has been asked to us so much lately. Wouldn't you say? A few times. How do we do it? Very recently. As the czars, yeah, it's just, how do you do it? As the czars <laughs> of, of the info email, Ross and I see this question asked, and... It's a good, valid question, but we want to put it out there so in the future we can send this segment you clip it? to people and say, here's your answer. Love it. Yeah, I'm on the edge of my seat. And I'm totally not trying to find it right now. No, and while you're not trying to find it, I can say something about, well, first off, how are you guys doing? You know, I didn't play too well on the, on the field this morning um, with Frisbee, but uh, that's okay. 
Right. It's not you know, about it's not about performance. Just because I was the first pick, you know, on on my team. Yeah, second pick overall. Right? Second pick overall to you. And I was team captain. Yep. Here it is. Looks like Ross archived it. There we go. Yeah. We got to search for it. So. All right. Trevor asked. I was wondering if you could educate me on the parentheses un question mark. I respect that because I understand exactly what he's saying. I got it as well. Un question mark importance of coffee being certified USDA organic. Oh, wow. From what I've read, it's costly and difficult for a lot of farms to maintain compliance with certain USDA standards, and some of them might not be as relevant for coffee as other foods. I've also read about mold that can be on some coffees and was just curious how the team at Valor has addressed these quality control issues. To be clear, I've only had excellent cups of coffee from Valor cafes and bags, so I'm not concerned about a quality gap in Valor's coffee. Question just comes from a discussion that I had with some family members about quality control on third wave coffee roasters, and I'm curious how the roaster I use handles these issues. Thanks so much for taking the time to respond, Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. You got some cool family. You got some cool family, and you are very articulate. Getting around the dinner table, talking about USDA, baby. The ethics of coffee sourcing. You guys want to tackle this? Well, I slash my wife care, care a lot about organic food. So <laughs> I, uh, I have an interest in this. And so it's been something on, our, on my mind for a long time. And whenever we source green coffees, I mean, like, Whenever you're looking at a, a green sheet, and I'll I'll default to you, Riley. How many of those coffees are certified USDA organic? I know our it uh, doesn't paint the picture for the whole green market, but our our importers. Yeah, I would say we work with a few importers, as many smaller roasters do, before they can form extremely direct relationships. And if I had to guess on a spot sheet, it would be like zero to five percent of coffees wow yeah is it true that a lot of them are ethiopian because i've just noticed most of the ones i've seen are ethiopian i would say more so than maybe colombia not but that is not to even take into account the other certifications that matter even more if i see an organic coffee versus a rainforest alliance coffee uh and we can you know tackle that and i can read a good definition of what rainforest alliance means I do see some of the, some of those other certifications yeah. a bit more often. And so whenever a coffee does not have that certification, you could ask like okay, why? And what one of the reasons could be that they spray the crops with pesticides, right? Mm-hmm. I mean that's that's a big reason why wheat wouldn't be certified organic or or whatever pick your product. A tomato. Yeah, you know, pesticides Pest control, right. other other associated words. Um, you got that definition of rainforest alliance. Yeah, I mean, at it, it can be boiled down to the seal means that the certified ingredient was produced using methods that support the three pillars of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. So uh, great environmental standards and, you know, great social standards, great economic standards. For rainforest yeah, alliance. Yeah, exactly. And I've seen a lot of those in Central and South America. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know exactly fully why but um so you could you could ask all right so maybe they want to qualify for usda organic but they can't because they use non-organic materials to process their product that could be one thing but i think the the main reason is the the farmers the farms that we source coffee from via our importers cannot afford the usda organic certification Mm-hmm. And I don't fully, it'd be cool to know like what that process really looks like to get that certification, how much it is, how much red tape you have to go through, why, like a full study on why farmers aren't getting that. Um, but I mean, ha- have we ever talked to our importers about this specific topic? Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, the answer is that, you know, kind of what Trevor laid out in the email in in essence, these farms are organic or close to it. And a lot of times the hurdles and whatnot that they have to jump through to achieve organic uh, certification would almost be more of a an environmental impact than just growing things how they currently are. So, you know, you're, you're growing coffee at a very high altitude, which is a part of it. Like, you know, it's, 
I just just all that to say that these certifications are just almost an, an arbitrary thing to add on to it. That yeah, it, it's like anything else. It's you know, you could taste coffee, you could have an amazing palate, but not be Q certified, and you want to go get your Q to like put the stamp on it. Mm-hmm. And that is what is happening at many of these high quality farms. And I mean, that is how they are achieving their high, high, high levels of quality because their standards are already so high. So it's unlikely that a coffee is going to score a 90 and their growing methods are trash. You know, right. it kind of reminds me of, uh, at the Alpharetta farmer's market, there's this meat vendor, like a, a farm in, in the mountains in Georgia. And they, they have like a bunch of awesome meat and they have to put, uh, intended for pet use or like not for human consumption on the label. Mm -hmm. because they are so small that they can't afford to get the certifications you need to like be, is it, I don't, it's not FDA, like uh, whatever, USDA, whatever the the certifications are to be fully in compliance with food for America. But in, in they're certainly not like organic, you know, uh, certifications on there, let alone Mm -hmm. just like basic food certifications. But it's incredible meat, and it's like grass-fed and finished, and it's at the highest level. So Mm -hmm. kind of similar parallel to coffee there. The mold, yeah. So the mold is, that's interesting. And from what I can tell with mold, I mean, first of all, you are working with a fermented product. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, with any fermented product, what amount trace amounts of mold are in all of it? Wine and kombucha and yeah. sourdough bread, and so on and so forth. So I would say that, if I'm being honest, mold is not even something that is even on our radar because it is so not of concern. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that, I, I believe, and forgive me if I'm wrong, that this marketing message came from Bulletproof Coffee and that you know selling that their coffee is 100% mold-free. And then you're like, uh, is other stuff yeah. not mold-free? And it, it w- w- really seemed as if something was conjured out of thin air to incite worry, in my opinion. Well, not that I'm assuming mm. that our products are covered in mold and pesticides. If they even were running them for 12 minutes at 400 degrees or whatever, I'm like, wouldn't that just get rid of anything bad because you're torching it. But I digress. I was also thinking about the fair trade certification where that's also just a, another pay to play certificate where we just pay so much above the marker for that, where it's like, this is like so removed from the actual business of buying specialty coffee. But in so many other lines of industry, I'm like we were saying, going to the grocery store, you're like, yeah, the organic thing is going to be more expensive and more better. So it's like, duh. Yeah. So it's like, why isn't all of your coffee this way? Mm-hmm. If we only sourced organic fair trade coffees, one, how would we even do that? And two, do you think we would have a better product? And three, do you think we would sell more of it? I absolutely don't think our product would be better. That I was. I think our product there. would probably be worse because we'd be so limited on our about menu options. Small menu. Uh, our prices would be higher. Our product would be worse. Touching on the fair trade subject really quickly, the fair trade price floor is a dollar and eighty cents. So wow. we have never purchased a coffee for a dollar and eighty cents, and we will now. <laughs> What's our cheapest coffee? Is it like three? It's like three, like around three. Yeah. Yeah. Our so, most expensive dollars a pound. Probably like mm-hmm. seven, eight, nine. Yeah. So with with that being said, you know, the point there, this this statement, this arbitrary thing, and then direct trade as far as that goes, that can mean so many different things. And I don't even wanna <laughs> that's another topic for another time. We could do a whole series on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to, with that being said, you know, the the fair trade thing like we're so far and above you know beyond fair fair trade pricing yeah yeah that's the thing that 
we can say that on a podcast and we could even put that on our bag that like, Hey, this isn't fair trade. This isn't, or that would obviously be just like wasted copy space. But like people don't like the majority of our customers. I wonder how many of them care about that. Mm. Or like, would they, if there's two Ethiopians on the shelf and they're the same price and one of them's organic, like somebody's reaching for the USDA certified organic. But if we always did that, if we always pursued that path of organic fair trade, like a product wouldn't be as good. Yeah, and I w- even will say that talking about the three dollar coffee, you know, you could trace that back because we are purchasing this, purchasing that through an importer. So obviously, they have a profit margin and they are making money on the product. But even if you traced it back further than that, it's still not below one eighty. Yeah, for our cheapest yeah. coffee. So clearly, with all the other ones above that, it's you know looking even better. I was just thinking too, if that concept of just buying fair trade or organic certifications you're kind of squashing a lot of smaller farms opportunities to grow yeah as well like is it actually better for the world if everybody was certified usda that's i don't know Mm. yeah next question hi question for the next q a segment what is the best way to make syrups for your coffee how much do you make at a time and how long do they usually last i think that we can answer this question by saying in our community that we're creating, which you can sign up for at the top link in the description of this video or podcast, we're going to have a course about making syrups, or Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to call it a course or a mini video type of format, but we're just going to show you how we make our syrups, and I think that would be the easiest way to actually see us get our hands dirty, sticky, get our hands sticky. But it's really simple. And Ethan, why don't you take it away? Well, Riley, how we make our syrups, pretty easy. All right? Just just like espresso, you just have a recipe, and you can kind of do variations from there. Think about it just as a simple syrup, one part water, one part sugar, and then throw in your, your flair, whether that's steeping lavender petals, whether that's adding cocoa powder, whether it's melting the sugar, whatever. Um, yeah, just starting with a simple syrup and adding flavor. And then you can kind of get, get freaky from there. Yeah, and we usually go two-gallon batches for most of the stuff, right? Yeah, barring like our, our big guys. We have some pretty big pots here that we can do some bigger batches with, but it, it is just like a lot of liquid to handle. Yeah. Um, and probably like a month, I'd say, max. I mean, the more the more ingredients the shorter the shelf life. Yeah, it depends on what, like, it's kind of interesting. Like, we'd make a peppermint syrup last year, and it'd probably be good to, like, right now because that peppermint oil just is so protective Mm. versus, like, um, maybe, like, a... Fall spice or something? Yeah, I was seeing something like a vegetable or a fruit is just a lot more likely to spoil. But sugar is a pretty, like, uh, it's... And on one side, really good for fermentation. On the other side, it's like a really good preservative. So Mm. if you just keep it in the fridge, you'll probably be all right for a while. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and there's going to be more in the course. Yeah. I think in the course, too, we could talk talk more about for a cafe setting, how you can scale syrups. Mm. Like how can you keep up with the production of it? Mm -hmm. Because we've we've tried a lot of different things over the years from – making syrups behind the cart in a, you know, milk pitcher or, uh, you know, on the counter to like an actual production area. So, yeah. So go ahead and drop your email at the link down in the description and we'll keep you up to date on when that's going to release. In other news, as you can tell, we're wearing our new merch. How about that? Valor just dropped some new merch. I'm wearing a oh so stylish Ooh. hoodie. Show the arm. Show the arm. Got our show the arm. Staircase logo here, and when <laughs> you, you just dab, dab. <clears throat> that's when cool. you dab. When not you dab, if. you show the Valor logo on your arm. Yeah, we put the logo on the arm. Very hype beast of us. Yeah, we're it's guilty. And then Ethan, why don't you sh- show what you're working with? Got Coffee the, stains and all. Got the <laughs> off white, creamy pocket tee logo. Other oh, stuff. Oh yeah, they see it. They my, see the stuff. My back look good. Wow. Been doing rows? Yeah, stay rows, man. 
Uh, yeah, it's a pocket tee. Got a little or the new little circle design on the back. And then Ross, come on. Wow. Valor, small center chest on the front, and then the staircase towards the neckline on the that back. That one, this one's my favorite. You, you serious? Like I like, well, I like wearing this co- kind of color. I knew you'd you like let that. me wear this one, though? Yes. Wow. Well, I like wearing that one more. So Whoa. maybe we switch know, at yeah. the break. Yeah. yeah. At halftime. Yeah. Well, you can find this at Valor's website, which is, of course, down below. So we're going to jump right into a little two part segment we're going to have over the next couple of weeks. And it's just all about extraction. Three dudes talking extraction. I wouldn't have it any other way. And you might think, oh, extraction, they're going to talk about under extraction first. Wrong. Wrong. Incorrect. We're going to talk about over extraction Shit. first. First. Yeah. And it's going to be so fun. Wait, 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 wait. We're talking under, over. Riley, what's extraction? <laughs> what does it even mean to extract something? Well, think, let's think about the movie. Is there a movie called The Extraction or something like that? Uh, yes. Let me look that up. What, keep, what keep does going. that mean? That means you're taking something and you're pulling it out of a circumstance. So, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Coffee is the circumstance. Let's talk, about, let's talk about flavor. Flavor lives in a circumstance called coffee. And what we are going to do is pull it out of that circumstance using water and a filter. And Minerals in the water. So all that we're doing with extraction is simply using water, passing it through coffee, and pulling out flavors in a way that makes the final product taste really good. So over-extracting would be taking too much out of the coffee? Is there even such a thing as too much flavor out of the coffee? Hey, just real quick, there is an extraction one and two. Chris Hemsworth? Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. <laughs> Netflix. Yes. 67 on Rotten Tomatoes. So Make sure to go watch if it. you want to know about, you could call it extraction two over extraction, I guess. Yeah, like T-O-O. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're just, with over extraction specifically, what we see happen with extraction in general is that too low level of extraction equals bad not good mm. uh not yummy right great levels of, and we're going to dive into detail on this here in a second this is very uh cursory boilerplate yeah <laughs> so uh, said, i've never understood boilerplate. and then you have good levels of extraction which is what we aim for and then if you extract a little too much, you start to get some not-so-pleasant compounds present in the cup. Yep. So you have to find the, the perfect threshold of extracting as much as possible before you start extracting the bad stuff. Right. Maybe it'd be good to go through, you know, whether it's a pour-over or whether it is espresso, what are the variables at play here? Because we're talking about mm, extraction. Yes we're talking about manipulating extraction. Uh, moving the coercing, ne- moving uh, the needle, as it were. So let's just take uh, a pour over, for example. So you have the dose, which is how much coffee, ground coffee, you use. You have the yield, which is a little bit of a confusing term. Yield Two part. Yield is usually uh, just how much water you're pouring. So that's where you get into brew ratios. We like a one to sixteen or a one to seventeen. Sometimes a one to fifteen. Um, I'm feeling crazy. But yeah, usually 1 to 16 is the default. So dose, yield, and then uh, less talked about temperature. Mm-hmm. But I have some interesting thoughts on this later. Temperature. Um, I can't wait to hear it, man. Yeah, they're going to be good. And then you also have grind size. And then uh, time is a product of grind size and also your pouring technique. Um, agitation, baby. You all, yeah, you got agitation too. Come on. Uh, especially with the WDT tools in the mix now. I have some interesting things about agitation. In there the you course. go. In, in the course. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so those are the variables at play. And um, we, we did some reading. Uh, light we, reading. We did some light research on extraction over extraction. Really, the main ways to increase extraction are by using a finer grind or by increasing the yield. So another way of saying that is like if you were – uh, if you're doing a pour over and you did a one to 16 brew ratio, you might keep everything the same, but use a one to 17 brew ratio in mm-hmm. essence, right? I mean, just more water, more water, because the idea is that 
if you keep that, and that's another thing with dialing in coffees is that a la scientific method only change one variable at a time. If you, Huge. if you brewed a, a pour over and it didn't taste right, but you changed two variables, then you wouldn't know what changed what and why. So increasing the yield only one variable at a time, the, there's more water running through the coffee, so it makes sense that it would just extract more. Mm-hmm. Can we please change this episode to over extraction? What changed what and why? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, credit where credit is due to the people at Barista Hustle yes. and Matt Perger for all of their excellent research on this topic. Uh, and also Jonathan Gagne, who is has a website called Co- Coffee Odd Astra. Ooh. And like the movie. Yeah. We got his book too. Yeah, he has an excellent book called The Physics of Filter Coffee. If I would have finished it, I'm sure it would be very applicable to this episode and I could say some crazy stuff. Hey, there's always next week. That's right. Yeah, I'll finish it yeah, this week. Right now. Yep. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, talking about variables, uh, you said that you might have something interesting to say about temperature, and I would agree, and I wonder if it's kind of the same thing. Um, I would say even another variable in this uh, layer is the roast level of coffee that you're using. Uh, I, I see. I saw this on Instagram a couple of days ago. Uh, a big coffee account posted a recipe, like a World Brewers Cup recipe, and it included temperature as a variable. And it made me think: What is the use of including temperature as a variable if you're not going to incru- include the roast level of coffee used? Because that really affects it, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's a brewing recipe. So it makes sense that the recipe would be about brewing, not roasting. Mm -hmm. But roasting has so much to do with the end product that if you post a recipe and you're telling people, hey, this is somewhat applicable to your life, but you don't say anything about the roast, yeah, Mm. that makes total sense. That is really interesting because I think for so long we've, the specialty coffee narrative, big specialty is what I'll call it, has pushed against talking about roasts. <laughs> the establishment. <laughs> They're like, it's not about roast. It's about origin. It's not about the roast. It's about origin. And yes, a lot of uh, roasters probably roast similar similarly. But even just tasting a bunch of people's different coffees, it's pretty different too. Yeah. And when you, what you're saying is, when you're changing roasting levels, you're you're basically your playing field is just shifting. Like, because you're messing with the solubility of the coffee, how easily that coffee can dissolve into the liquid. Mm -hmm. And so if you're just like working with two different coffees and you follow the same recipe, ooh, fun. We had to to change a lot about, not a lot, but it was... was, Everything. It was kind of hard to... uh, to adjust from a drum roaster to an air roaster when we switched the loring. Yeah. Our, I mean, brewing our coffees was a good bit different, especially free throw on espresso. Mm-hmm. That was that was a big shift. Yeah, yeah, it was. So, yeah, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. Just you know, dark coffees are so much more soluble. And even on the spectrum of our menu, you know, take a workers' comp versus our washed Ethiopia, and we're going to be uh, grinding a lot different in those scenarios. Yeah, I mean, in a blanket statement, the darker the coffee, the coarser we would go mm-hmm. because it would it's so much easy, easier extracted. Yeah, and then also the lower temperature we would t- typically use to brew the coffee. So, mm. uh, you know, I might brew a super dark coffee at 198, whereas I might brew a really light coffee at just off, just under boil. Wow. Isn't that funny too? Like uh, <laughs> a, a darker coffee, by and large, has less complexity because the roast is sort of taking over the in, you know innate qualities of the green bean, and so it, it's more easily extracted. You contrast that with a lighter roasted coffee, which hopefully has a lot more complexity, but it's it's harder to nail. Mm-hmm. So it has more complexity, higher ceiling, but I guess a lower floor. And I mean that makes sense why like at at Waffle House they just roast the crap out of their beans and throw it through a machine. And I'm sure they have a system. Oh yeah. But it I mean it's going to taste like dark roast, you know, Waffle House because right. it's it's a lot more forgiving. Mm. Um and we've seen that too like with with wholesale partners where we we recommend a darker coffee 
especially with a cart, like you can nail workers' comp, our darkish roast, a lot easier than you can a, a washed Ethiopian, even mm-hmm. though the washed Ethiopian would be super cool. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's part of just like the skill of the skill of being a exper- an experienced barista, and and the ability to dial in and wash Ethiopia really fast. But we've been doing this for years, and that's still hard. <laughs> okay, so can we just come out and say it? We're starting off talking with over extraction, right? But that I guess let let's go through our understanding of extraction initially, like when we when we started in coffee. The basic thing that we learned and the basic thing that we teach now is like the main way you affect extraction is the grind size, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the grind is finer, that equals more extraction. If the grind is coarser, that equals less extraction. And so that, that is a good base understanding. But the more we've been in coffee and the more testing we've done, the more hours we've put in behind the bar, the more research we've done through great people like Matt Perger, Brees Hustle, and and Jonathan. Um, There's a certain point where you realize that over-extraction is actually really rare. Mm. Uh, So, like, I I remember multiple times behind the cart and behind the bar, we're, like, trying to over-extract our coffee, and we literally can't. Right. Um, And we'll get to this later, but we did some testing that totally supports that. We weren't trying to support that. but overextraction is rare. But in the event that you do overextract your coffee, how can we fix it? For sure. Um, that's what we'll be talking about. But what what next do we have here? Yeah, so I, I guess the the big question that's ling- lingering in my head... Oh, it's tense in here. ...is what what is good extraction? Right. What, what, is, what is the window of good extraction... What is the window of over extraction, or you know perceived over extraction, and how how do we discover that, and who came up with those metrics? Yeah, is it all just taste? Is it like this taste this way, thus it is this, or is there numbers, cold hard facts? Yeah, Ross. Well, um, there are numbers, and there is also subjective taste, wow. and those two interplay with one another. Mm-hmm. So, um, ever heard of a refractometer? Anyone mm. out there? Mm. I have. Co- mm. Comment below if you've ever used a refractometer, and if so, was it helpful to you? How did you use it? But uh, we have one here, and every time we use that thing, it is always enlightening. It Sends always shock waves through a, the company. Absolutely, um, and it, it usually surprises you, uh, which which is sometimes frustrating but it expands your horizons. But basically, a re- all a refractometer is, in case you don't know, is it tests the solubility of a liquid. So how you use it is you, you calibrate it with distilled water because distilled water has absolutely, I mean, nothing in it. Right. It's just pure water as opposed to like a, you know, a spring water or something would have a higher TDS than distilled water. So you calibrate, what are you going to say? TDS total dissolved solids so what a refractometer is doing is flashing light through the liquid and reading what's in the way so that's why i use distilled water it starts at zero and then when you put coffee through it it's like how much is in the way what percentage mm-hmm. yeah which yeah. is such a great highlight on what extraction is yeah and i mean like you look at the difference between a a pour over which uses a, a paper filter and let's say a French press, which uses a metal filter. I mean, if you if you took the TDS of those two things, I mean, it would stand to reason that the French press would almost always be a higher TDS just because it's letting more particles through that metal filter. That's just a hypothesis we could test. But uh, basically, this refractometer gives you objective numbers to analyze your coffee along with the subjective taste. Um, and SCA, Specialty Coffee Association, their their statement on uh, on well, I guess before we get that, we need get to there. We need to say what extraction percentage is. Yeah, because if you're just thinking like, okay, TDS total dissolved solids, I want more. I want it to be strong. Then you could do a four second shot of espresso, and it's six grams, and it's 
crazy full of coffee. It's like a couple drops come out of the, the porta filter. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it tastes like big doo doo. All right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry for all the people doing six Ew. second shots out there. But so I think it's important to understand. Um, when you're starting to brew coffee, you're on a downward slope for strength. It's going to start the strongest it'll ever be because that water is just getting the first fruits, if you will. It's picking up a lot of solubles right out of the gate, and then it's just slowly decreasing. Whereas in, you're, you're starting at the lowest and moving up for extraction if everything's going well. So you have these like, what is that? Crossroads. Yeah. You got two things happening. And I think that is especially true with espresso. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm not even sure it maybe you guys can can correct me here, but with a pour over, when you're when you first start pouring, that the liquid coffee that comes out, you know, during the bloom, is that the strongest it is coffee? Yeah. Because I mean sometimes it looks watery to me. Mm. But it, it would make sense that it's the strongest. Maybe you're hitting the filter, bro. <laughs> yeah, I've done the salami test on a pour over before. And like it's oh, pretty, interesting. it's pretty evident. So it's the same principle same as principle, espresso. Yeah. Okay. You, I mean, obviously, to less of an extent because everything is just so much more constra- uh, constrained in espresso versus pour over. Yeah. Do you want to explain the salami thing real quick? Yeah. Yeah. It? We kind of talked about it a few episodes back as well. But a really great way to be able to test extraction and to test this over a spectrum is to you can do it with pour over, or I'll just speak in terms of espresso. Pull a sh- pull a shot of espresso and take a cup and switch it out every five seconds over the course of the shot. That way you're just splitting the shot up at you know at different time variables into different cups, and then you can taste each one. And, and see s- it too. Yeah, and, and also visually see what the extraction, uh, what, what the, the time of it pulling and, and the extraction across the entire shot does and how the flavors are imparted into the beverage. So what you're saying is really good, and that's why T- TDS is uh, it's a good variable, a good variable, but it's not the only variable because mm-hmm. the other things at play affect it so much. Like you were saying, you know, if I want to hire TDS, I can just use uh, you know less water and make the coffee stronger. But if stronger, but if you only do that and that's your only variable you're not really getting a full vision of whether the coffee is well extracted or not and clearly it wouldn't be if you only shortened things down to a very small amount so that's where the extraction percentage formula comes into play and helps out a ton so this is where you use a refractometer you find your tds and then you you're going to multiply that tds by the total beverage weight. So this isn't the yield, as in this isn't, you know, the amount of water you used in your pour over. This is, you know, through through the filter, this is the how much the final product weighs. Mm-hmm. So you're going to find that number, multiply it by the TDS, and then you're going to divide that sum product result, result by your dry coffee dose, and mm. that's going to give you your extraction percentage. So you could, we're, we're talking about increasing extraction here. So if, if you increased the amount of water that you poured, that would give you a lower TDS, but mm. a higher extraction percentage. In theory. In theory, In theory right? Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it's going to, um, those... It's funny, that's where dialing in super, super well is so hard because those numbers just change each other and in right. ways like balance each other out and like change the curve of how things progress so much. And you really just have to do this to see how that works. Yeah, because in if you think about it, if you just added more water, you're making the product weaker, which is going to give it a lower TDS. But you are extracting more, so you you may hit, the sweet spot of lowering your TDS but increasing your extraction percentage, and they're both in healthy boundaries. Yeah. Because mm. and knowing that is probably pretty helpful. And I don't know if we have that off the top of our dome, but like for espresso, I think we usually look for like eight to eleven percent or something like that. Where we were arguing about this the other day. TDS. Yeah, on TDS for espresso, I can't remember where we ended up. But like even for a pour over, do you remember your? Yeah, yeah. Pour pour over TDSs ended up being like, uh, 
1.5, 1.3, 1.7. That's just freaking crazy though, too. Yeah. Because yeah. that's saying that 98.5% of a pour over is water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is important. So that those are some some TDS numbers as far as extraction percentage. This is where I was getting to earlier. The SEA recommends eighteen to twenty two percent range mm-hmm. of extraction percentage or extraction yield is another mm-hmm. term for that, uh, and that's that's evident across espresso and drip. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You want to know something funny about those metrics, uh, Jonathan Gagne in the physics of filter coffee the book that we were talking about lays out that chart and how, you know, 18 to 22% is the metric. I can't remember the exact date, but I'm pretty sure that chart was created in like the fifties. Whoa. And it is still, it's still in a lot of ways rings true. I would say not so much in, in the sense that like we were talking, we want to push our extractions as far as we can before other variables start to occur. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I would not doubt having the best cup of my coffee and it being 23.5% extraction or something like that. Um, but another funny thing that that says is that studies show that uh, 0 to 14% perception of a coffee isn't as poor as it is from 14 to 17.9%. Whoa. So that shows you a lot of the variables of how, uh, you know, a, a coffee across the spectrum and at different times, it's pulling out different things, how that affects There's the taste of the yeah, coffee. Yeah, different windows. Yeah. That's a good highlight on the power of extraction percentage, for sure. Mm-hmm. And again, all all glory to uh, the perg of a breeze to hustle here for writing this awesome stuff. But, uh, you know, talking about how that range came out in the 50s, what grinders do you think they were working with back then? And what kind of coffee were they working with? What kind of yeah. coffee? Like, what... what what were the the pieces of equipment they were using? And, and he he was talking about how we're we're pushing towards higher extraction percentages now because we have grinders like the EK forty three where the grind size distribution is so uniform mm-hmm. and there's there's less microfines, there's less boulders. Mm. Um, yeah, or even like the the entire point of the Weber EG one. It's like a four thousand dollar grinder that a lot of home brewers are buying. It's fines distribution is so it, it, the micro like micro fines that it produces are so few that it's almost impossible to clog a filter. Wow. Yeah. Hey, cool. Yeah, and and it would be interesting too to know like whenever like a Barazza Encore, right? So like this is the grinder I have at my home and was sort of like the a, a great entry level burr grinder conical for mm-hmm. home. Whenever you grind coffee, that's like relatively acceptable for a filter. The, the distribution, like how how much of that grind is actually where it needs to be, like as far as the size of the particle, how much of it is microfine and how much of it are boulders, hmm. you know, because if, if it's a bunch of microfines, then that coffee is going to taste more over extracted because microfines extract kind of instantly uh, because the, the surface area is so exposed, whereas a boulder extracts a lot more slowly because there's less surface area exposed. So, I mean, the power of the EK-43, I mean, that's why it's that and the the Guatemala are like the standard for cupping. Mm-hmm. Flat um, burr as well. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, that's all a really, really good point. Can I go back to something real quick? Please. We were saying 18 to 22% for extraction, and you might be thinking, wow, out of 100%, that's pretty low and bad. I don't know, bad. But... Only 28% of roasted coffee is soluble. Mm. So mm-hmm. you're not, that, that, that kind of shrinks your whole playing field a lot more. That kind of clicked for me <laughs> because. Yeah, if it was 100, it would just be a coffee bean sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. We got it through the filter. <laughs> it comes back together. <laughs> yeah, because you have all these like sugars, acids, salts that can break down and go through a filter and end up in coffee but you also have a lot of like carbon and cellulose that don't break down from water Mm. and i thought that was really cool that was a good thing to know and two we'll get to this in under extraction but when you were talking about with the different windows um the pergmeister was talking about how like salts and acids break down a lot quicker than sugars Mm -hmm. and then the uh the bitter components the polyphenols 
they come in later. So it's all like this little chain reaction of uh, what you're experiencing. And maybe we'll, by the end of this, we should hit like three or four tasting uh, characteristics of under extraction, good extraction, over extraction Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, totally. So as far as over extraction goes, what, you know, we kind of hit, hinted on it a little bit earlier. Let's dive a little bit more into the characteristics and, uh, you know, what, what it really, really is and, or maybe what it is perceived to be and why this perception happens. Mm -hmm. So when you guys think about just a classic over extracted cup of coffee, what comes to mind? The first thing that comes to mind is it's pretty rare, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but the the way that we teach it in our course and in uh, in our training for our people is especially with espresso. And I, I learned this from counterculture like seven years ago, but uh, you taste under extracted flavors on the front end of the sip. So as soon as you you take the sip and it hits your palate, you're you know you're getting blown up with like grassy salty acidity mm-hmm. and then the finish is just hollow and gone gone um and then over extracted is kind of the inverse of that so you you take the sip and then it just kind of feels like dirty hot liquid but not much flavor and then once you swallow it you get those uh smoky but the coffee should not be smoky at all kind of thing but like not like roasty smoky like cigarette smoky just dirty bitter ashy um these kind of flavors on the back end. Uh, and it, that finish tends to just sort of go and go and go. And then I, I love to, I can always tell an underextracted shot, like even a minute after I swallow it, because you can start to notice like, okay, I swallowed this espresso like a minute ago, but what's on my palate right now? For and overextracted. For overextracted, yeah. yeah it, it's still there. So, I mean, those are some some main tastes for under and over extracted but let's say <clears throat> let's say you're tasting those under extracted flavors what would what would be the first thing you do let's just say let's just say with a pour over mm. you know like what would be the first thing that you guys would do to fix that so i'm not going to mess with my ratio very much with a pour over so my one and only thing i would do to try to fix this would be assess the bed of coffee after i'm done brewing and see if there was a channel, and we can dive all into that here in a second. If I see that there is a channel, I know that there is either a problem with my technique, a problem with the bed of coffee before I started pouring, or that I was too fine. And I would, you know, kind of try to think back to how I brewed that coffee. Was I focused on the process of the brew? If I was, and I know that I did all those specific things correctly, I'm probably just going to coarsen up on my grinder. Yeah. <clears throat> and maybe <clears throat> just uh sorry, getting choked up. Uh you said I wouldn't change your ratio, but if you're out there listening, I'll just say double check your ratio too. True. Cuz yeah. you might be doing some math wrong or something cuz we were saying maybe the one of the only ways that you would do this why why you would over extract your coffee is because you're accidentally doing like 1 to 18, 19, 20 as your brew ratio instead of like a 115, 116, 117. Um, but yeah, coursing up the grind. I don't know if you guys noticed this with porvers, especially with the gooseneck, which is probably what everybody uses in this day and age, but it really does kind of come at an angle. And so mm-hmm. I have started just rotating my uh, brewing vessel. Or if you're using the next level pulsar, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> but if I'm making an XF, it's such a narrow. Uh, bed Mm -hmm. that if I'm just like doing this the whole time the water is just kind of coming in at this angle Mm. and by the time it's done I'll realize that the right side of the bed is a lot more raised Mm -hmm. and the left side is all more down that just happened to me yeah so you have um, something you probably have a localized over extraction Mm -hmm. and you have localized and under extraction and really we could do a third episode episode called uneven extraction because that is probably what's happening 95% With over extraction of the time. Yeah. or perceived over extraction. Perceived, I was sure. just about to say that. Like how many Yeah, I said wait, it first though. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I was thinking it earlier. Doesn't but, count. <laughs> um whenever you brew a coffee and it doesn't taste right, 
and you're like, okay, what do I do? Like brood again, just do yeah. it again. Because it, the, check yourself. The probability that it's an uneven extraction is way higher than it. It was a perfectly even extraction. It was just under or over extracted. Yeah. Mm. And I think that was another thing that like we we haven't thought about. We didn't really think about that in the beginning. It was like, well, I wouldn't be the problem. Like <laughs> I know how to tamp. Okay, you know, and and that that probability is just way higher. So I mean, that again was another big emphasis of of Perg's. We need more nicknames for Perk. Yeah, whenever you were running your tests, which we'll get to here in a minute, we I, I was, you know, really harping on you, like, do it all this exactly the same. Yeah. Because and, and that's the thing, in your day to day, just making a pour over, it, it's all about uh the way that you frame the coffee that you're drinking for the day. It's perspective. It's perspective. Because I don't stand over my pour overs and give the most intense attention to it whenever I'm doing it. But when you're running tests like this or you're dialing in a coffee, it's really important to do that because if you don't, even just the pulses and the flow rate of your kettle, those are going to change what the refractometer tells you at the end of this brew. It's Mm -hmm. going to change the TDS. Even Jonathan Gagne, he has the Weber EG1 and all this insane equipment, and he measures his flow rate perfectly. He is probably the best at doing that, but his extraction yields for a V60 are only to within 0.2% uh, of perfection. Mm. Back, like if he brews a pour over back to back the exact same way, he gets a 0.2% difference. What pour over device does he use? Does he, does he say? He, I mean, he used to use a V60, but he helped develop the next level Pulsar. So that's oh, his new Oh, right, right, thing. right. Okay. Yeah. So we talked about one way to, the main way to fix over extraction is by making the grind coarser, yep. which it's always nicer to make the grind coarser than finer. And we'll, we'll get to that at the end. But uh, the next way, like we said earlier, would be to uh, pour less water. Mm-hmm. So even if it's just by a little bit. You know, like if you're just getting a little bit of that overextracted flavor on the finish, then take 10, 20 grams off of your your yield, your the amount of water that you're pouring, because by doing that, you're extracting less. There's less water going through that coffee, so that coffee is going to be less tired, as it were. There's just less water going through it. Mm-hmm. Um, but make sure to do one, change one variable at a time. I'd say one way you're guaranteeing some overextraction, at least in part, is if you're doing a pour over and you're experiencing clogging by the end. Mm. Um, in a commercial setting, that's really not so much of an issue for us because we're doing a lot of espresso and like by the cup stuff. But for all the at homies out there, are there any like at home hacks to work on not clogging up your V6 or your cleater? Well, that's probably a good switch right there going from a, pointed filter to a flatbed yeah for sure and I, I you know that's all just about preference like if someone really likes a conical brewer then they just want to stay with that but the again credit to jonathan gagne on this fines tend to migrate to the bottom of a brewer so if you're working with a grinder with a very uneven particle distribution then you're going to have a ton of those fines going straight to the bottom. And That's then, true. And I've then, seen yeah, that. And then lining the entire filter. The boulders yeah. are like on the top usually. And that includes on the sides. So mm-hmm. if you have your slurry and you get your slurry up and up high, when you watch it drain down, you're going to have a ton of fines on, on the edges. And that is going to inhibit filtration and, and thus cause the clogging. So the expensive route is to buy the $4,000 Weber EG1. Call Easy, it day. yeah. yeah. But Wrap if, it up. if you don't want to do that, you can buy a sifter, like a Kruv. I mean, realistically, if we're talking about, if we're saying that fines tend to migrate to a bottom, you can stand there and get a very cylindrical, especially if you get something that's like more narrow, and just start shaking it. All your boulders are going to start migrating to the top, and all of your fines are going to start migrating to the bottom. And you think you're helping because you're like trying to move things <laughs> along, but it's all just yeah, settling. But, but with that being said, you know, you want a, a decent particle distribution, but that's going to change a lot of variables. So, you know, a little bit more expensive way, I would say step one would be move from that. Don't use a step one is don't use a blade grinder. That's going to be the biggest amount of particle distribution. That's going to be really bad. So use a, a high quality burr grinder. Uh, you know, maybe if you have a Baratza Encore, you could step up to the fellow ode, or, you know, if you're still not satisfied with that, at that point, you can then start looking to change your that's another thing. If you have an old grinder, get new burrs for it. Get nicer burrs. Maybe get SSP, uh, you know, 
burrs that are tailored for uh, filter brewing, like the ultra low fines SSP burrs could be a good option. Would you recommend pre-grinding at a, your local EK43 wielding <laughs> coffee shop? Yeah, if you are having such trouble with the other variables, I would say to go with that. But I would say for most people who are listening to this program on over extraction, they're probably pretty gung-ho on grinding at home they want to do their own thing yeah so um you know that that could definitely help like you know even some people with eks behind their bar might have those ssp ultra low fines already installed in there and then even uh the ek's current burr geometry produces such even and great particle distribution compared to 10 or 15 years ago Mm -hmm. oh man i could talk about that all day Woo! Grind size. So we, we kind of talked about local over extraction. And I think that is a little bit of our thesis hypothesis on this subject is that most of the time you're not really over extracting the entire bed of coffee. But what is realistically happening is that because you have ground the coffee too fine, the water finds the weakest point of resistance because you know your fine coffee is starting to group together and so you then have a channel and through that channel it's causing all sorts of problems channeling i would say is what the number one thief of extraction wow. it's so hard to see in pour overs too yeah exactly so you you know you have this happening you have water passing through just straight up water but then on the walls of this channel you're over extracting that coffee and then all of the other coffee in other areas is going to, towards that point. So you're under extracting other coffee. So that is where I'm stressed. I know that is where it matters so much to have a quality grinder and to have a very repeatable and uh, systematic way of brewing. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a channel. You're going to taste that coffee. It's going to taste bad. It's going to taste astringent because you know in that area you're you are. Uh, extracting more of those polyphenols you're extracting the things that happen later in that one area and then you might freaking take the refractometer and test it and it might be 22 percent and you're like you might make it finer yeah exactly yeah. you're like or or it might be 18 percent or or 19 percent, and you're like why is this happening mm-hmm. but it's not happening because you need to you're under extracting the coffee it's happening because i mean you are unevenly extracting the coffee Mm -hmm. And an uneven extraction is the hardest thing to diagnose and to fix. So that is where we say, if you're having that, the best place to go is always coarser. Yeah. And another, back to your question about if you're a home brewer, how do you avoid over extraction? Uh, I've noticed that doing more pulses helps. Instead of just, or like clogging too, just filling up your your brewer. Because like you said, the fines go to the side and to the bottom. Mm-hmm. So an, another way to fast track that as if it needed it, what is to fill your V60 all the way up to the top, because when you do that, as it very slowly drains, all those fines are just going to go even more towards the sides. Mm. But if you're just doing, <coughs> excuse me, if you're doing 50 gram, 75 gram pulses, then that slurry which is the water and the coffee hanging out together in the brewer, that's never going to get high, like too high. Mm-hmm. So that, w- that was a big switch for me. I mean, doing pour overs in the beginning, like I, I never even thought about like a, a systemic approach or systematic approach to, to like, you know, pour 50 grams in this amount of time, wait this amount of time. And um, I mean, like when you were working at Chrome Yellow, you guys, how many pour overs do you think you'd make in an hour? I mean, a decent bit, and this is no shade to anyone who's doing pour overs behind the bar, but that's where I always question that system of someone who is splitting their time between one task and a pour over. Are you really doing it justice? Exactly. Right, yeah. Because yeah. you're like, I could just hit my total yield, fill this thing up, yep. turn around, and then... Yeah. So that's where you have to you know, make better choices about what type of brewer you're going to use back there. Mm-hmm. And... That's where we, even right now with our pour over system, we're completely rethinking it because these devices that we have behind the bar, unfortunately, aren't giving us a repeatable results from they one lose, brew to another. Yeah, they lose temperature a yeah, good bit. And they, and they lose temperature, which is such a huge thing. So we 
have been playing around with uh, what Lance Hedrick is calling the Nomacano, which we have done in a fashion before being a coffee shot, which credit to Matt Perger again, kind of brought to light in his WBC routine where you're basically pulling an extremely long uh, shot of espresso. And Mm -hmm. you then can run that through a paper filter For us, we always had trouble with that part, so we just would skip that part, and you would get a cup of coffee with a very high TDS, a very, very high, thick body with with crema on top. And so, but if you run it through a paper filter, the fines clog the filter. Mm -hmm. But Especially a V60, which is probably what we were using. Yeah, exactly. And But Lance put out a video a couple weeks ago where he was using a paper filter and the port filter as well. So the port filter doesn't have a problem with clogging because there's nine bars of pressure coming through. Yeah. So you're sending it through that paper filter, which then allows you to filter the rest of the crema off in like five to 10 seconds through the V60 filter. And we've been trying that and we're like, this is better than the pour overs we're making at our cafes right now. Big time. Yeah. I don't know how I got on that. I'm sorry. That was a tangent. It's cool stuff though. You want to talk about the experiment day? Sure. Yeah, the the question that we were trying to answer here is how does grind size affect TDS and extraction percentage and taste in pour overs? And also, is it really the finer the grind, which leads to more contact time, uh, result in a higher TDS? So is it true that the finer the finer you go, the more TDS you get? Right. Is it true that the and you know a finer grind would make it harder for water to pass through that coffee bed, which would make the brew take longer. Does that really always you know result in higher TDS and higher extraction percentage? And this just a disclaimer this this was not a this was a pretty like boilerplate. T- I'm just kidding. I still don't know what that means. Um, it was, using it wrong, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty boilerplate. We the the experiment was. Uh, four different grind settings on our EK. Yeah. And I made one pour over of each grind setting. So, you know, a real scientific experiment, we would make multiple of each and then take the sum or take the average of, of those numbers. So just take take that for what it's worth. Yeah, where's your chart? Don't yeah, I, chart. Don't, I don't have any charts. Come on. Um, where's your axis? So what we did, uh, again, another disclaimer, we, uh, like Riley said, I was very, uh, I was very intentional and methodical, which shout out to Will Shirts coming on the, the show soon. Um, Wait, what? But uh, about you know, I I followed uh, James Hoffman's V60 recipe, um, which you can check that out on YouTube. It's great. Um, but I did you know pulses in a certain amount of time. I forget all the numbers, but every every pour over was the same. I tried to be a machine as much as possible, and then even down to after the brew. I would wait a minute and 30 seconds before taking the TDS of that brew. Hmm. So it was all, I just tried to be as as scientific as possible. Um, So I'll just run through this quickly. Uh, We ground at 5.5 on the EK, 7 on the EK, 8.5 and 10. Which will mean something completely different on your EK, just to be clear. Absolutely. Because we have a more specified dial Mm -hmm. that could just be totally different. Right. And for, for what it's worth, we do calibrate our EK to where uh, at zero, the burrs are barely chirping. So we calibrate it the way that the, the factory tells us to. So that'll get you maybe somewhere close. But um, we did a 15 gram dose. We poured 250 grams of water, which resulted in a 215 gram beverage weight. Uh, and the numbers were as follows. So ground at uh, 5.5 on the EK. So the finest setting, the TDS was 1.51, which resulted in a 21% extraction percentage. So like pretty good. I mean, that it, the, all of these pour overs were pretty tasty. They, they were all, I was very pleased with, uh, with, I feel like they were all even extractions. Mm-hmm. So were again, you, were you using a distribution tool in your practice? Like a like a WDT on your bloom. Right? I d- I didn't do that okay. because I didn't feel that it was uh, replicable. So yeah. I would do I did exactly what James Hoffman did, which was a, a swirl, which still is not that scientific. But you know, in the bloom, I would be like one, two, 
kind of thing. So one Mississippi. Right. So 5.5, uh, that w- those are the numbers. Seven, which is coarser, we had a 1.55 TDS compared to the 1.51. And then a 22% extraction compared to the 21% extraction on the finer setting. So we went coarser and we extracted more. Interesting. 8.5, which is coarser, we uh, had a, a 1.41 TDS and a 20% extraction. So lower TDS, lower extraction percentage. And then finally, the coarser setting, 10 on the EK, a 1.3 seven TDS and a 19% extraction. So if you work backwards, the coarsest setting, like I just said, had a 19% extraction. The next finer, 20%. Finer, 22%. Finest, 21%. Mm. So this supports, and again, this was one pour over for each for each grind setting, but this supports the idea that just because you make the grind finer does not mean that you will extract more. Mm-hmm. Um, and the hypothesis of this this fi- finest grind was that there was likely some channeling that occurred because it was the, the finest grind, but the extraction percentage was lower than the previous setting. Um, so, I, I mean, I looked at the bed after the brew, and I didn't see this you know gaping channel through the middle of it, but somewhere in that slurry, I mean, I I would I would love to do a more extensive. Uh, testing on this eventually, but that is a great takeaway. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're dialing in pour overs, uh, and, and this is um, again pergs, but try to find the most, the, try to find the highest extraction percentage you can go, whether that's through grind size or whether that's through increasing the amount of water that you're pouring. Mm-hmm. Try to get that thing up to like 23, 24%. I mean, have you ever brewed a coffee at, at that percentage that you I, can remember? I have never extracted 24% out of a coffee. Okay, so if you could, try to, and then back off a little bit. Take off some of those, what's this, this P word you guys are using? Polyphenols. So take, the, you know, uh, remove some of those by extracting a little bit less, and then you'll kind of be in your sweet spot. Yeah. But Did, it, you, did you remember having a favorite? My favorite, uh, my favorite was the twenty percent extraction, hmm. which was the eight point five. Yep. So, and it was a one point four one TDS. It was, it was like a, a washed Ethiopian, like lighter roasted, um, roasted by Sunday coffee, uh, which I think uh, we got via Meadowlark. Yeah, so Sunday, somehow. the Sunday coffee project. Yeah. But it, it was roasted really well. So yeah, maybe at that twenty two percent mark, you were already starting to extract some of that poo poo. Yeah, and you wanted to back it off a touch, and then you're in your in in that sweet zone at twenty with, yep. with that specific coffee. Exactly, and we haven't said that yet. Like every coffee is gonna have its preferred extraction percentage. Um, you know, it, it'll be different for each one. So, because technically you're in the range of proper extraction on all of those. Yep. So it does kind of start going down to like what is tasting the best. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks for doing that, Ross. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fun. One last note on percolation versus immersion. So a lot of times with you might you might be wondering, you know, with a French press, even though you know it's coarse, why is it that you can fill that thing up and wait for five minutes and it could be a good, tasty cup of coffee that's not over extracted? And the note on that is immersion, you don't have the agitation that you do with mm. percolation. So if you're brewing a V60, that stream of coffee is constantly causing that slurry to be agitated, which is a good thing if you are doing it within you know certain variables and trying to control that. Unfortunately, agitation is one of the hardest things to control about brewing. So with percolation, you aren't having that agitation, which is causing less of those polyphenols to be extracted in that course and span of time. Look how far we've come, guys. We're just talking slurry, <laughs> polyphenols, extraction Versus percentages. Versus one of our first episodes being uh, sports talk about Jimmy G and how handsome he is. <laughs> In his future. He's injury prone, man. I'm just, he's a good, <laughs> he's a good QB, handsome he guy. Wins. He wins. He's a winner. But so <laughs> what? let's just, let's just say this. When, when is someone actually, actually 
over extracting their coffee? One, when they have their recipe wrong Mm -hmm. and they're just using too much water. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're using a really dark coffee. Mm. Probably the most common. That'd be the most Mm -hmm. common. So if you're like probably not listening to this podcast and you're putting like a little bit of coffee in your coffee maker. Um, Other than that, it would just be you're using too fine of a grind and you didn't channel. Because that, that's possible too. Yeah, good luck. You know, like like this, <laughs> good the, night, the ex- experiment we did, this this 22% extraction ground on seven at the EK uh, was over extracted, but it still tasted awesome because mm. it was an even extraction. There's probably good coffee too. Right. And so like, yes, I could pick out some of these like un- over extracted flavors that the over extracted, the, the way that this coffee over extracted was less about the negative flavors that I was tasting and more about the positive flavors I was not tasting. Mm. So that, I think that's oh, very a, interesting. That's another thing that over extraction does is like I said earlier, when you first slurp the coffee, you're getting less of that like bite and acidity that you want, especially out, out of a washed Ethiopian. Mm-hmm. So it was more tame and subdued. And then the finish, I mean, it was like a good finish. So I, I think that's worth mentioning is over extraction is not just about tasting, you know, sweaty flavors on the the finish and it's also about like what are you not tasting throughout the whole course of your experience Mm. and the when i made it finer those like jasmine floral acidity sweetness it came out so much more so Mm -hmm. we didn't talk about this ad nauseum uh but if you're working at a cafe and you're making espresso you're gonna have that like one-off 48 second shot. Yeah. I would really recommend tasting that and being like, hey, is this even over extracted? And it probably is. Be like, what am I experiencing when I taste this? Versus when I'm like messing around with like a 24, 25, 26 second shot and I'm like, oh yeah, this is over extracted. Be like, really? Like, what am I tasting here? Because mm-hmm. you're probably just tasting uneven extraction. Why, why do you think that 48 second shot happens? Uh, thin air. That's a mystery to me. Yeah, because you would think channeling. Well, you think you're channeling every other shot, and then you finally have yeah. one that you doesn't. Finally channel. got a, a winner. <laughs> right. Um, maybe that, but dude, I that's kind of a mystery. Hey, I, if you know the answer to that, comment below. Because it, it do be happening, you know, just mm-hmm. these one offs. And I don't know if it's like this mystery machine in the grinder where all these micro finds are kind of like building up around the edges and it's then gotta be and then one time it just pushes them all out mm. I, I don't know interesting i mean i've seen this this is a, a bit of a, a myth but like when people first learn coffee they're like how hard should i tamp is that the main way we dial in like you know if this shot was more sour do i need to tamp harder and vice versa which Obviously, you keep your tamp the same every single time. It's not a variable you should mess with because you can't quantify it. Unless you're really good. <laughs> unless unless you're yeah. very high level. Just kidding. But I've seen like when people absolutely crush the puck, that can that can make the shot go go slower. That's but, true. But that's you would think with channeling, the coffee's like spewing through the channel, and you're going to get it out in like 17 seconds, and it's like watery and yeah. and all striped. But that's a mystery. Hmm. How about that? Well, this has been fun. I have to fun. come back next week and do another episode on under extraction. <laughs> I'll be here. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe provide some questions about extraction. Oh, you know, we can see what, what yeah. people are dealing with at home True. or in the shop. Yeah, if you got some questions on extraction, drop them below or send them to our Instagram at Valor Coffee Pod or email them to us, info at valor.coffee. We mentioned being in the market for a new grinder if you're having some of these problems. We do sell fellow odes on our website if you want to pick one of those up. Hello. Heck, I think we're even going to put the Opus on there as well pretty soon. Uh, so if you are in the market for a new grinder, buy from us and as a, as a thank you for this program, right? It's the least you could do, <laughs> seriously. Uh, but in the meantime, if you're not going to do that, maybe check out our merch because that is rocking or sign up for our community top link in the description put your email there and we will email you and we're going to even put out some surveys about what you want from this platform from us and how we can do things specifically for you 
Okay, time to review some coffee. Yeah. What'd you guys think while we were uh, sipping on this coffee from One Line Ooh. throughout the episode? Well, thank you, One Line, for sending us this coffee. They did? Yeah. Oh, wow. If you want to send us a coffee, then please do. We will review it on here. We hold no punches. We're we're very honest about it, so just be prepared for that. But uh, you can send us an email, info at valor.coffee, or you can send us a DM on Instagram at valorcoffeepod, and we'll send you our address, and you can send your coffee to us to be reviewed. Okay, boys. Let's just start with um, packaging. We're going to mm-hmm. start in that department, mm-hmm. specifically on content. So this bag probably is not lacking any content. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's got a lot of words. Yes, it does. And that could probably be a divisive uh, mm, conversation. Mm. Yeah, I would say it's got a lot of words on it. Yep. It's got some visuals there with the custom bag, mm-hmm. but the I've never I, the sticker's cool. It's got like that shape to it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is no. Uh, I was gonna say no offense, but where is the review? I don't know which side's the front or the back. I'm guessing it's the. Same. I think it's obviously gonna be the side with the name on it, but the brand has the bigger na- uh, like font on the back. I was like, uh, which one? It's like they uh, they took the information that you would usually put in bullet form, like meters above sea, blo- sea level and the processing, and then they just put it in a paragraph. Yep. Um, okay. But honestly, there's some cool things about it, like this uh, QR code in the top right corner takes you to the farmer himself talking about the coffee. Mm-hmm. That's baller. Um, printed roast date. You always got to respect that. Printed, oh, yeah. printed roast date, but then it even says best brewed between 10 and 45 days off roast. That's kind of baller. Respect the game on that. Um, and that's just, this is just content. This like, is, do we like the content that's on the back? This isn't like, is there too much or too little of it? What do we think? Yeah, I, I would think that mm. content lives apart from aesthetic. Okay. Well, then let's do content one out of ten. Great. Three, two, one. Six. Eight, nine. All right. Six, eight, six, eight, nine. Seven point five. Seven point five sounds good <laughs> to me. Yeah, we're scientists over here. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything else that we really have to say about that. There's a lot of content. There's a, a a brew recipe on the side, a very simple brew recipe, but also says visit our website for dis- device-specific dosing and brewing instruction, which wow. is cool. Anything on the bottom? Oh. oh, this bag is made from nearly all plant-based renewable materials and 60% can compost under certain conditions. You so- like that, Ethan? <laughs> don't you? Yeah, I'm in love with that. Cool. Um, okay, moving on to the aesthetic of the bag. All right, let's do it. Three, two, one, six. Five. All right. Yeah, I think, you know, what it has in content diminishes the aesthetic because it's just a little too much. I would, I would almost like to see, you know, specifically this part, I would say they have so much about their brand here. Um, and I, I think it would be, it would help out maybe if they would move, if they would move the logo up a little bit and then narrow the margins here. Uh, it's a a daunting. Yeah. The font is just a little big and, and a a touch abrasive. And then, and then you also have a label with a ton of words on it, pretty slim margins around the edges of the label. I think that's a little bit of what's going on. So, uh, you know, maybe move some of that to a QR code, simplify your marketing message about your company on here, and you would be uh, probably in a pretty good spot. Yeah, I I mean, it's all decently subjective, but at least in my experience, less really is more sometimes as far as engagement. Like, Mm -hmm. even when I was over there brewing it, I had time to read it, but I was like, uh, yeah, uh, I'll just move on. Well, Mm -hmm. the trick is to, like, get... Get the content out there that the majority of the people will care about. And then the content that is more specific, 
there's a there's a less there's a smaller section of your customers that care about that. So put that on your website because those are the people who yep. will go to your website to read it anyways. Yeah, yeah. And like the QR code is really cool too. I I really like that. Okay, it's got me wanting QR codes on our. We stuff. keep talking about it. Oh man, we're talking about it. Okay. UX, user experience. I was the one that got to make this coffee. Thank you guys for that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, bag rip, Stellar. Um, How's the zipper? Zipper did reseal. That's always a win. Mm-hmm. So you just rate this one. Okay, UX, one out of five. Yeah, one, two, three. three. Uh, four. 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 Uh, All right, no, great. No questions asked. It was easy. Nothing... I think what would take it from a four to five is just if there was like a fun thing mm. or any sort of like bonus, but it was just very uh, classic. Mm-hmm. But classic's cool. Classic okay. is cool. Okay, coffee. You guys want to start with the crunch? Or yeah, we, start we wanna... with the crunch. Okay. I mean, we've already drank all of our coffee, so why not? Oop. <laughs> Oop. Hey, there you go. There you, you go. Gave me way too many. What did I give you? Two? Three. That's crazy. One of those is a jumbo bean. Okay, crunch. Hmm. That's a good crunch. <laughs> Isn't that, that funny? Week. We're talking about extraction, but like our saliva is <laughs> helping the coffee. What? What's happening when we crunch and taste? Whoa, oh my goodness gracious. Well, that's the thing is if it's a good crunch, then the cup of, like if you had a perfect 21%, 22% extraction, it should taste like what we just tasted. Wow. And I think a good crunch also tells you if the coffee was roasted well or not because of inner bean development. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, crunch. Three, two, one, five. five. That was the best crunch I've ever best had. Best crunch That's score. Crunch. <laughs> we should have <laughs> what a, a scientific metric. We should have a Hall of Fame. Yeah. And this just made it on best crunch. Yes, it did. Dude, I don't know about cold fermentation. So that was the process. Mm. It says Colombia Monte Blanco, cold fermentation, pink per bone. Um, Does it t- not tell you on the bag? <laughs> this offering is his cold fermentation wash process. The coffee is picked, the skin removed, then placed in a cold room to extend the fermentation process. Mm. The temperature depends on the bricks measurements of the cherry. The coffee is dried in full sun for five to six days, then in shade for 18. Interesting. Isn't that funny? I just didn't. Because I, I didn't know <laughs> where to start on the paragraph. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I'm not dumb. All right. I'm you can dumb. read. Just a little, just a little I bit. can read. I can read. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like growing coffee at a high altitude. You have slower development, which causes more intense and uh, crazy flavors. And mm-hmm. I'm getting it out of that. Yeah. So it's like washed, fermented. That's super cool. Mm. Uh, flavor out of 10, three, two, one, eight. eight. Man, we're aligned. This was good. It was a good, good coffee. Very good. Yeah. Um, you guys got any specifics about it? Notes? You got to respect when a washed coffee shows up with a lot of flair. I don't know how much of that was impartation due to that cold fermentation mm-hmm. um but i mean brightness was near perfect mm-hmm. for me flavors were popping off left and right yeah just it, the right amount of delicacy i thought yeah mixed with like i was when i was smelling it i was getting like peanut butter and mm. it still had this like kind of si- thicker chocolatey base mm. with a lot of fun uh flair on top yeah what would have made it a 10 for you guys I mean, just being absolutely mind blown, or what? Yeah, yeah, same here. Like, yeah, I think what have we ever given anything above an an eight on flavor? I don't, I don't think so. Because that was, I feel like that is the best coffee we have sat here and drink. Yeah, over yeah. the Burundi last week. Yeah, yeah. I I think so. It, if you Burundi might have been an eight as well. But this was this was good. Look, I'll bump it to a nine, guys. I mean, you guys. <laughs> and no, I, we're talking about nine, ten. I, I viewed that the same way I would like grading a Q grading a coffee like a ninety two or a ninety three. It's got to be like some freaking Wilfred Lamastis ish. Yeah. You know? If you're listening, comment 
if you have ever given a coffee a nine or a ten on flavor. I know you're not using the same exact <laughs> grading system. I guess system. scientific grading and, system. And some of this could come down to our own brewing methods, but maybe if there's just such extreme clarity of specific flavors. Like yeah. I think about, this isn't a great example because it's, it's like a freaky coffee, but when we first got that work of Saccaro anaerobic natural, like the potency of how much it tasted like watermelon sour patch kids i was like this is insane Mm -hmm. you know so even though there was a lot of fun complexity there maybe it just maybe if something was even more potent yeah or clear i i I would say that's it clear and balanced for me balance is a lot of it this was extremely balanced extremely balanced if you had if you know and that's where i think you what you're gonna you're gonna get to nine ten just based off of expensive expensive varietals and processing. I wonder how much this coffee costs. I don't know. We, we never check it out. We never talk about that. Like that's the true. coffee we were drinking last yeah. week was forty dollars. Yeah, that's true. That's um, pretty nuts. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to enjoyability. You guys ready? Yes. Three, two, one. Nine. nine. All right, getting a nine. I mean, I couldn't ask for much more out of it as far as like. It reminded me of free throw in the way that you can just drink it and it's great. Or you can be like, whoa, I really do taste the lychee in there. Mm. One line's got several locations. Cool. Really? Yeah. Uh, all through Columbus or all over Ohio? Because it looked like they were all in Heath. East. <laughs> they're east of Columbus in Heath, which I'm not super familiar with. Mm. Uh, I don't know, dude. It's all right. Yeah. This cool. coffee. Oh, that's a natural. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. I have to do the math. 12-ounce pouch, $23. I might be yeah. buying a coffee from them in the future. Uh, that, that is how enjoyable That's like is. mid mid priced. I mean, yeah. like a 10-ounce would be close to 20 or 19. Mm-hmm. So one day we should do an episode on what makes coffee more or less expensive. Mm-hmm. That would be cool. Like varietal, process, rarity. Location, location, location. Total score, 39. Wow. (laughs) Pretty good. Pretty good. I think that might be... I should just know this off the top of my head better. I think that might might be number two. Didn't we give a 42.5? To free throw. Was that free free throw (laughs) with Caleb? Hey, I mean, get this thing in... uh, I mean, this is just our our opinion, but you're asking for it. I mean, get that in uh, some better packaging. I mean, you're... Yeah. Blowing us out the water. No joke. This yeah, that was an amazing, amazing coffee. Yeah. And, um, and that's the thing, too. It's like sometimes if you just know that you have amazing coffee and you just want to put a bunch of copy on it because you're talking about the coffee, Yep, that totally works with a diehard group of people. Mm-hmm. They're probably, I don't know this, I doubt they're trying to like maybe go global or like get this thing in every grocery store and they're thinking about marketability they're like they might just be thinking about the coffee and that's that's yeah that's awesome and it shows that they're thinking about the coffee because it's (laughs) freaking awesome (laughs) okay thank you thank you one line thanks for giving us a whole bag too Mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna make sure this thing gets uh i'm taking it home what no no boys that was such an enjoyable morning with the two of you and all of our listeners oh i had fun over extraction how to fix it Next week, under extraction, how to fix it. I'm fired up. It's gonna be. Go! It's gonna be easier to talk about. I mean, it, which is just a cool revelation. Mm-hmm. Um, but thank you all for listening. We really appreciate all of your support. Um, if you enjoy this show, please make sure to subscribe on your platform of choice. Review, uh, comment on the videos. We're trying to generate more interaction with our with our people that listen. Um, so. Anytime we're throwing it out there, like comment below. Hey, we'll comment back. We'll start a conversation in the in the comments. <laughs> yes, we will. We start are fighting the comments too. <laughs> and if you disagree, then I mean, we'll we'll prove you wrong. But I mean, uh, so thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Yes, we will. Love y'all. Good night, nurse.